All right, thank you. It's awesome to be here at the um, company that in many ways made the production of this book possible um, and which has multiple, multiple copies of the book stored within its vast um, and comprehensive archive of all the world's culture already, whether it knows it or not, uh, thanks to my Gmail account. Um, as Will said, I grew up in Montana where uh, manly men and, and even more uh, impressive women uh, kind of run the show athletically. I myself, as you can probably tell from my pathetic appearance, uh, grew up as sort of more frail, uh, bookish, inward-looking child, um, although I was always a big sports fan. So uh, from an early age, I was trying to figure out how I related to this world of sports and outdoor activity in a way that made sense for me. Um, and yet was also true to my uh, essentially nerdy nature. So um, a few years ago in Portland, while I was working as a newspaper reporter, I started writing about sports, and I, I began to gravitate toward these sports that were, in one way or another, sort of a DIY approach to sports. And, and there were a lot of different aspects of that and a, a spectrum of, event, of activities that I felt um, qualified. Uh, so that this book kind of grew out of that exploration of sports that were outside the realm of the mainstream major league professional sports, sports that were being done by individuals and groups, uh, more or less self-organized or on a DIY level. So with that said, I'm going to read a couple passages that I think sort of get to uh, what the book is about. It's amazing what you can learn with your head jammed between two rugby players' thighs. It was a dank October evening, and I was at work on a story about the Oregon Jester's women's rugby team. They invited me out to a practice, and at the coach's suggestion, I brought my soccer cleats. I soon found myself ordered to crouch to the scummy turf, then wedge my head between the legs of the two players in front of me. These women, a prop and a hooker, applied a stubbly vice grip to my skull, pressing from each side in an apparent effort to reduce my ears to pulp. Then I reached up between my new friend's legs to grab the waistband of their grit-spackled shorts. I heard the hooker growl. Grab crotch, not hair, she said. It sucks when that happens. Okay. Intimate arrangements complete, we formed a compact human battering ram, or scrum. We smashed full force into an iron sled called the Dominator. The dominator looked like something that would be useful in taking out a Frankish castle. My face was about a foot off the ground, and I could only hear barnyards squelching as we hurled ourselves against this torture device. Thirty seconds later, I wobbled to my feet. Well done, rookie, the prop said. Well done. I nodded my head, now smaller, in gratitude. The jester's turf, once grass, was now reduced to an oozy and foul-smelling black muck. From here, I could see the outermost edge of the sports world. Lacrosse players bellowed on the next field over. Just across the rugby field's boundary, two guys were exercising attack dogs. A few street lamps, orange and hazy in the perpetual Portland mist, provided the only light. I felt like I was in the right place, even though I hadn't expected near decapitation. I was writing about my new rugby friends for Portland's alternative news weekly newspaper, which had drafted me out of Montana to edit its music section in 1999. Not long after I arrived in Portland, perhaps feeling that an endless diet of underfed and emotionally bereft indie rock bands threatened to zap the, zest, sap the zest from life, I started badgering my employer to assign me sports stories. My editors agreed to let me cover this self-declared beat under the mistaken impression that I would generate actual news about sports of interest to the public at large. I planned to do the opposite. I covered bike messenger races and adult soapbox derby. While this direction didn't exactly Endear, my, endear me to my editors, I felt that I had pierced the polish, polished surface of mainstream sports, and that was before the thing with the rugby player's thighs. So what did it mean, all this fumbling around on the margins of sports? I thought I detected faint but definite tremors, something stirring underground. Yes, the major leagues now achieved new frontiers in hype and pomp every season, but what if at the same time a revolution was taking shape? What if a whole alternative sporting nation, a more perfect union of independent athletes, nonconformist fans, wildcat leagues, and guerrilla clubs scattered across the country could rise up and challenge the mainstream? I began to dream big, imagining that a total inversion of the sports power structure was occurring just out of sight somewhere near the rugby practice field. I admit that it sounds a little far-fetched and dreamy, 
but I knew that vaguely similar upheavals had happened before. If you think about it, Major League Sports could be the athletic equivalent of Stadium Rock. The production values, values are awesome, but the scale is alienating, and the egos are enormous. The bitchy psychodramas of the Kobe Shaq Lakers recalled Fleetwood Mac in full wife-swapping meltdown mode. Tiger Woods once reminded me of James Taylor in his bland excellence. Now we know he's more like a less entertaining one-man motley crew. The excesses of stadium rock, of course, inspired punk rock, which insisted that anyone who could play three chords could and should form a band. Now I thought the same thing could happen in sports. How great it would be if I wasn't simply crazy. I thought the raw ingredients for a renegade sports movement existed, but obviously they had yet to emerge as an identifiable cultural force, unless you count self-aware urban 20-somethings' tendency to form dodgeball teams. Perhaps I was engaged in wishful thinking, so I decided to go exploring beyond the boundaries defined by newspaper sports pages, talk radio, and 24-hour cable. I wanted to see if the sports counterculture I hoped for really existed, or if it could. As I stood on the rugby field that night, checking my spinal column, I began to think I was getting somewhere. If I survived, it would be fun. So I started to, uh, I started to seek out athletes and events on the sort of stranger end of the sports world. And before long, I found this bike race in Iowa called the Trans-Iowa, which is organized by one man who is named Mark Stevenson, but who is known to everyone as Guitar Ted. Uh, because of his teenage love for Ted Nugent. So I knew right away, before I even met him, that Guitar Ted was a man after my own heart. And the Trans-Iowa sounded like something I needed to check out. It was a 300-mile endurance race that begins at 4 o'clock in the morning in a small town, leads the participants through the middle of nowhere Iowa farm, company, uh, Iowa farm country for hours on end with no support, no kind of outside assistance, nothing like the Tour de France style, cars driving alongside them with spare bikes and you know extra drugs if they need them. Um, so nonetheless, this sport was, this event was attracting dozens of participants from all over the country and seemed to have kind of a little bit of a sort of an underground legend growing around it. So I went to Iowa to, uh, to track the Trans-Iowa and meet Guitar Ted. And this is a little bit of what occurred. Hawkeye, Iowa, population 489. At Trinity Lutheran Church, the sign announces that at 8 a.m., just six hours from now, Pastor Mike Horn will deliver a sermon entitled, Safe in God's Hands. A spooky moon shines down. I am not wearing pants. Leaning into the passenger side door, I rummage around inside the red Pretender, my rented Pontiac pseudo sports car, fighting the entropic storm of granola bar wrappers empty soda cans, separating gas station coffee cups, crumpled clothes, and dried yellow tan mud. I find my thermal long johns, hop around on the cold gravel as I pull them on, then step into Carhartt cargo pants and hiking boots crusty with grime. The good people of Hawkeye can now rest easy. Not that local sensibilities seem too delicate. Ten minutes before, a pickup truck lumbered around the corner at the telltale pace of a DUI Dodger, and bumbled over the curb and into the middle of the lawn across the street. A woman jumped out and sprinted inside the house. She left the driver's side door open. She left the country radio station on, blaring. The latest Nashville hits now pound through Hawkeye's half dozen comatose streets. First I expect the cops to come. Then I realize there probably aren't any. Ten yards away, a man called Guitar Ted leans against his car, a blue beat-to-shit Honda. He is drinking Red Bull, talking. Since four o'clock the previous morning, I have followed Guitar Ted down hundreds of miles of dirt roads and two-lane highways with long, frequent stops. He has been drinking Red Bull and talking pretty much the entire time. Man, some of these people in these small Iowa towns, he continues, pointing over at the pickup truck between poles at his little aluminum can. They're bad. I mean, they can get wild. You think these farm towns would be all nice and quiet and traditional, small-town American? I guess in a sense they are, but when the bars close, I can't really follow it. I like Guitar Ted a lot. Caravan with a man for 22 straight hours and he either becomes your temporary brother or an enemy for life. But Jesus Christ, like I say, 22 hours. He shows no signs of weakness, exhaustion, or imminent silence. Right now, I could strangle Guitar Ted through his wolfman beard, curl up on Trinity's porch and beg Pastor Mike for forgiveness and sanctuary safe in God's hands. This whole thing, pogoing around pantless in some forsaken hamlet, on a diet of power bars and gas station coffee, waiting in the deep freeze for a pack of bicyclists for the love of God, right now I blame Guitar Ted. 
We are tracking the Trans-Iowa, a 300 plus mile nonstop endurance bike race through some of Iowa's most beautiful and least vehicle hospitable quadrants. A race entirely the product of Guitar Ted's febrile mind. He is the race commissioner, course designer, referee, timekeeper, logistician, and prize committee. I guess that makes me the press corps. The Trans-Iowa enjoys no sanction from any official cycling organization, no status within any kind of recognized competitive framework. It charges no entry fee and offers no cash prize of value greater than the price of a bottle of whiskey. It provides no support, no course marking aside from Guitar Ted and in this case me, standing roadside every 50 miles or so, and operates on a strict every man for himself basis as far as health and safety go. It traverses roads that Iowa transportation authorities see fit to post with enter at your own risk signs. The previous year, rain turned the course into a mud sluice and not a single contestant finished. Still, about 60 riders started Trans-Iowa version three at four o'clock yesterday morning. At least a few of them are still alive and on course. In Hawkeye, Guitar Ted and I hope to catch sight of the leader, a rider named Ira Ryan. You're pretty much guaranteed a bar fight at 2 a.m. in any one of, ooh, light. Guitar Ted points down the deserted road, past the pickup truck. A tiny blinking white speck wobbles just beyond the weak penumbra of one of Hawkeye's few streetlights. Ira Ryan, a bony shard of a man in a red windbreaker and lycra tights, takes shape out of the gloom, canted forward over the handlebars of a gunmetal gray bike he welded together himself. Ira is a 30-year-old native Iowan, a professional custom bike frame builder, a cycling zealot, and by virtue of winning the first and only completed Trans-Iowa back in 2005, the event's current defending champion. As he blows past us, Ira crushes his pedal with an automatic remorselessness, steering by glazed stare. Later, he doesn't remember much about this scene. Hawkeye itself he recalls as a smudge in the periphery, indistinguishable amid visual hallucinations of phantom cows and ghostly rival cyclists and split seconds of lost consciousness. At this point, Ira has ridden over 200 miles with no sleep. The brain chemistry gets a little dicey. As Ira's flashing taillight fades into the darkness at Hawkeye's far end, I likewise feel delirium setting in. Of course, delirium is the Trans-Iowa's point. So I'll let you all discover the rest of the glory of the Trans-Iowa if you so desire. Um, but beyond self-torture of this sort, and Ira specifically said that one of the things that motivates his cycling career is his love of the glory of suffering, as he puts it. Um, on a less uh, sort of painful level, a lot of what this book is about is the sort of joy of participating in things and doing things yourself, even if you're not particularly good at them, particularly if you can do it in a way that feeds your social life or enriches your uh, sphere of acquaintances or circle of friends or things like that. It's, a lot of the book is about the sort of social side of sports and the exuberant joy that you can find playing games with your friends or making new friends through sports. So I'm going to conclude with um, one more passage, which is about a soccer team that I was on about 12 years ago in my hometown in Montana called the Carnies. The global soccer explosion well underway elsewhere hadn't quite happened yet in late 1990s Missoula. Social trends tend to wash over Montana about a decade late, and about half the time this is a good thing. Isolation breeds creativity, so my friends and I were used to making our own fun. Sometimes that meant hauling a rented generator down to the riverside to power a show by an extreme leftist punk band on tour from North Dakota. All too often it meant weekends aptly described as lost. In 97 and 98, it meant the Carnies football club. The Carnies wore black t-shirts. Our team crest consisted of a hand-drawn shield bearing a skull, a switchblade, and a bottle marked XXX. When I solicited a sponsorship at a local sports bar, the owner gave me a blank look and said, Soccer, huh? Well, I guess. We want to see you guys in here after every game, ordering plenty of beer. You think you can do that, buddy? I thought we could. I can't say for sure, but I feel confident that Missoula Co-Rec Division I never before saw and never again would see a team as awful as us. For our debut match, about 30 rookie carnies, lured perhaps by the team captain's talk of plenty of beer, showed up. 
Our sideline resembled a protest against the World Trade Organization, and every substitution opportunity devolved into total chaos. If memory serves, we trailed a well-kempt team from a law firm 5-0 at halftime. The referee, a tallow-skinned 50-something character who wore a vintage Santos FC warm-up suit and chain-smoked throughout the entire halftime, strolled over. Captain, he said, you've got to get your team organized. I didn't ask if he had any tear gas I could borrow. We did bag a consolation goal in the second half. A Carney striker, one of the handful of our players with real playing experience, nailed a scorcher from 25 yards out. A fantastic goal from any perspective. It must have looked especially beautiful to him because he was on hallucinogenic mushrooms at the time. As the season progressed, the Carneys improved a little. A Belarusian man named Pavel, a paternal gent with salt and pepper hair whom none of us had ever met, mysteriously started showing up promptly at game time to play for us every week. He proved good for a couple goals a game. Our pugnacious goalkeeper, a National Guardsman who both served in Afghanistan and played bass in Missoula's most venerable punk band, put a little muscle in our defense. So did the linebacker from the Montana Grizzlies football, the other kind, team, recruited by my brother, who spent much of his time in Carney's Black trying to start fights with opposing players. Our female players, it turned out, were much better than our men. For some reason, the Carney women tended to be more physically fit and left less lifestyle impaired than their male counterparts. I don't know why. Other teams, genuine amateur athletes seeking bona fide recreational competition, I suppose, seemed unimpressed by our freewheeling approach to the game. This is ridiculous, one snotty, snotty hotshot whined to a referee. These guys don't belong out here. His team had just scored three goals in 15 minutes while dodging homicidal slide tackles, so maybe he had a point. That didn't stop me from screaming, that was for you, motherfucker, when we, Pavel, leveled the score in a game that we, meaning Pavel, almost stole. The Carnies put together an immaculate winless streak. No other team, however, could match our party record. About half the core squad, including me, lived in a nine-bedroom decommissioned nunnery behind Missoula's oldest Catholic church. By post-match midnight, a choreographed wrestling match usually took place in the living room with Heinz 57 used as fake blood. We discussed tactics, technique, and lineups, but soon enough the day's soccer results started to feel irrelevant compared to the olive oil bell belly flop contests on the kitchen floor. Sadly, Pavel never joined us. I believe he was a religious man. So that will conclude the reading portion of today's events. Um, if anyone has any questions for some perverse reason, I will do my best to provide an equally perverse answer. Um, but if not, thanks very much. Questions? Sir, you, sir. Yeah, so you say you the mic. To the mic. <laughs> this is being recorded for posterity. Thank you very much for coming, Zach. Uh, you said you remain a sports fan, and I just wanted to hear kind of your take on um, the media that surrounds uh, famous, almost celebrities or sports stars, like kind of all the media around Tiger Woods sure. and his slew of his incredible conquest ex record. Exactly, yeah. and 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 other I mean, athletes. He's a as cute well. guy, but you know he's got kind of a built-in advantage having so much cash. Um, <laughs> You know, yesterday I was sitting in a, in a restaurant here in San Francisco eating lunch, and they had the TV on with the sound off, and it was one of these sort of sports, sports writer roundtable discussion shows featuring, you know, these crusty ancient dinosaur sports columnists from newspapers around the country. And they had a, you know, it was one of these things like you see on CNN or ESPN where there's the four, screen, the four sections of the screen, and it's one man's face in each of the screens. And they were all talking, and I don't even know what they were talking about because the sound was off. And these four old white dudes were sitting up there, like, and they were all talking. They were moving their hands and like gesticulating at one another, and you couldn't hear them, and you lost nothing with the sound being off. I mean, it's like a lot of it's, it's, this is not unique to sports. Obviously, this is a sort of a plague that infests our culture. But a lot of the discussion about sports in this country is just people talking and not saying anything. The appetite for sports information and the sort of commercial demand for it has grown to the point where. 90% of what you see and hear and read about sports isn't really about sports at all. It's about the business side of things or celebrity gossip about, you know, whatever terrible offense against common decency that Ben Roethlisberger has recently committed. And 
I, I guess part of the reason I wrote the book was a desire to cut through all of that, not saying that mainstream sports or big-time sports are illegitimate. Obviously, they have a huge audience, and I'm part of that audience. But to say that, you know, that stuff is not what really what sport is about. I mean, sport is about experiencing things, doing things that you otherwise wouldn't do, having fun, um, and getting out there and being part of the world rather than passively sitting back and listening to all this endless stream of garbage about Tiger Woods or whatever, you know, whatever um, the topic du jour is. So I guess that's, you know, my response to that would be that the book is sort of an attempt to kind of like claw some real meaning out of sports and drag it away from those people that are just, you know, jabber jawing about it all the time. Miss, go to the mic. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on like the gym culture, gym rats, people who like pump iron. I, I mean, I, I have been a member of a gym and I, I don't, I would never discourage anyone from trying to be healthy or fit. Um, except a lot of people think I am with this book. That's all about, you know, terrible, drunken, madcap antics. Um, but I find it a little bit depressing. You know, I find, I find when I walk past a gym in any city and I look through the window and I see ranks and ranks of people on treadmills with their earbuds in watching Fox News or CNN or ESPN and going like this, I, I just, you know, it's almost like a suicidal. It makes me feel almost suicidal. The, uh, um, and it's kind of, you know, you know, sports or, sport or ac athletic activity, one thing that is an underappreciated thing about it is that it's kind of funny. Like, uh, at least at the level that I do it on, and what, 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 the level a lot, a lot of people do sports on, it's like, it's kind of ridiculous. I play soccer for this team called the Unicorns now. Uh, we often get beaten very badly. Um, I am a terrible player. So it's, you know, in addition to like, you know, exercise or staying fit or whatever, it's also an opportunity, sports also provide me personally an opportunity to sort of laugh at myself. I kind of feel like that unseriousness is lacking in, in the gym world. It's sort of like in the, in the minds of the gym owners of America, all Americans are like thoroughbred horses. They just need to be like pumped full of specialty beverages and like run really hard and then toweled off and sent back out to the pasture. And I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that it doesn't have a place in the world, but there's more to life. Um, there's been like a recent insurgent, I guess, like increase in organized competitions of alternative stuff. Like, yeah. Uh, there's this thing called the Tough Mudder in New York where they go on, um, this mountain that's usually a ski mountain and, uh -huh. and they're, it's like in April. So it's really muddy. Right. They're running up the mountain. It's an obstacle course. Uh -huh. Bringing all this stuff. There's one in, in England called the tough guy challenge, mm -hmm. which I guess has been going on for like a yeah. couple of decades. Um, do you see like an increase in that kind of uh, organized sort of different type of sport? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there are, there are literally hundreds or probably thousands of sports and uh, events that I could have put in the book, but I didn't for, you know, simply trying not to drive myself too insane. Um, I mean, there's this thing in Tennessee called the Barkley Marathons, which is this like harrowing sounding endurance marathon through basically like it sounds like the world's most inhospitable terrain. Like there's this forest of sticker bushes in Tennessee that they make these guys run through. And essentially no one has ever finished it. Just to up the ante, the organizer serves all the participants a mandatory dinner of uncooked chicken the night before. <laughs> so anyway, this is getting us off the topic and into something quite disgusting. But um, I think that, you know, I mean, this is going to sound like a cliche, especially being at Google, but the fact that the internet now allows people to organize on such a sort of spontaneous um, and seamless basis um, has created this ex exponential increase in these kind of DIY events. Do you think, um, I feel like San Francisco would be like a great place. Uh, there's a lot where there would be a lot of activity there, but what city have you seen is, is the most? Well, I, I mean, solely for the purposes of my own laziness and limited budget, I did a lot of the book in my home city of Portland. Um, but I think, you know, there's a, there's a sort of, as I describe them, the left coast nerd cities, which I would, I would categorize San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle, and probably Vancouver, British Columbia in that group. It's these cities that tend to attract and foster these sort of 
I don't know what you would call them, uh, alternative approaches to fun um, and also have a, enough critical mass of people that are interested in doing different things that they, uh, that they spawn endless numbers of these groups. So Portland's a great one. Um, you know, but it, it was impressive to see things uh, thriving in places like Iowa. Um, I went to Austin, Texas for the Roller Derby National Championships. Austin is like the global capital of roller derby. Um, there's things all over the country, you know? I mean, it, and that, that was one really nice aspect of working on the book is discovering like, oh yeah, you know, these rediscovering in my case, since I'm from Montana, I'm totally aware that people in quote unquote flyover country have, you know, all these weird things that they do. But discovering that all over the country there are these cool events and cool people that are, that are putting things together. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm done talking about it now. <laughs> so you just kind of, um briefly mentioned that like the internet allows people to organize these mm -hmm. types of things a little bit more and kind of gives that um, access to more people mm -hmm. and also with just more media in general like if you get you know a really big TV package you can get channels that's like the alternative sports yeah, network those totally. types of things however I also think and I don't know if you touch on this in the book or not but some of that mass media also contributes to the dilution oh, of absolutely. some of the sports yeah. so what is kind of your I guess, opinion on kind of what is that fine line of having media be a good thing to kind of bring exposure to mm -hmm. all these sports, but then also media being part of the, the problem right. in diluting the... Well, I think roller derby is an interesting example of a sport that is confronting this issue right now. I mean, roller derby's gotten a tremendous... Since ro roller derby was revived uh, less than a decade ago, is this very serious, but also it's, a, it's an interesting thing. It's seriously competitive. It has a frivolous sort of image of women in tight outfits with weird names fighting each other on a track and bands playing at halftime ever getting really drunk. Um, but uh, it has also uh, spawned this incredible proliferation of national leagues or teams, city leagues around the country and national competition and very serious tournaments. And yet most of the media attraction it has, atten it has attracted has focused on the sort of superficial side of its appeal, which is these kind of rock and roll chicks who like to fight and beat each other up. They don't ever, the, the media coverage rarely delves into the seriousness and the sort of uh, the intense nature of the sport. I mean, and if you watch two of the top roller derby teams in the country go at it with something on the line, it's as intense as anything you can imagine. It's like the Yankees and Red Sox in the seventh game of the ALCS or something. I mean, it's just the, the animosity, the tactics, the speed, the strength, the damage, the bruising. Um, so here's a sport that's obviously found some sort of unlooked for, unexpected national success. It's attracted a fair amount of media attention. There's a Drew Barrymore movie, which I actually thought was pretty good. Um, so I was surpri pleasantly surprised, I guess. I would say, um, but yet what is really, what I found really special about it, which is that it's this sort of grassroots manifestation of sports for ba that basically attracts people that were never involved in sports before, it kind of gets pushed to the wayside. And they are definitely res wrestling with, with what sort of television coverage they want, what kind of media coverage they think is appropriate, what sort of level of sponsorship or involvement with uh, outside financing they can deal with while continuing to maintain control of the sport and its sort of grassroots nature. So I think that there comes a point where it's a fine line. I mean, you know, I don't think that, uh, I don't think the guys at the Trans Iowa really need to worry about this issue so much. But I think that, uh, you know, when something like roller derby or bike polo, which is another sport that's gone from being, you know, a scrappy sport played by about 15 people around the country to having a very recognizable core of national and international support. Eventually, it gets to the point where you have to say, well, what's going to happen to our sport? Is it going to become just another part of the sort of mainstream sports or alternative sports or extreme sports spectrum where TV and, and corporate sponsorship play a role? Or do we keep it or do our best to keep it underground? Um, I don't know if there's a right answer to that question, um, but there's certainly a time when a line is crossed I think it's about the time when a player cashes the first check from Red Bull. So, anything else? All right, seeing none, thanks very much, and uh, thanks a lot.